Hello and welcome to my little live stream from my improvised workshop here. I'm Theo and today I want to talk a little bit about how I make puppets for the Euroferns puppet show. If you are not familiar with the show, we do a live puppet show at Euroferns that usually runs between two and two and a half hours. We build our own puppets, not just me. We have now a whole team of builders that make puppets. I kind of started that and um, a lot of the patterns and designs that are used are made from my earlier designs. So let's look what we do. I build puppets with my own methods. I do not really use a lot of tutorials that other people made, mostly because my puppets are mainly smaller fursuits. I'm a fursuit builder. I have started building fursuits in 2004, and it is for me the easiest way to build the puppets in a way like a fursuit. There are of course some minor alterations. They are built the same way that I built fursuits. So um, a lot of the material that I'm now talking about is already online. If you are interested in the subject, I've got lots of tutorials, I've got uh, videos, and occasionally I also live stream on Twitch. Some of the more tutorial style videos are on my YouTube channel and if you want to reach me you can do that via Telegram, Instagram and Twitter. The puppets for the Europeans puppet show. Back in the day we used to use Fort Manus puppets like this one. But as Europeans grew so did the stage and if you have a thousand people, um, puppets like this are not really visible anymore from the last row in the audience. Also, a lot of these puppets do not have very visible eyes or mouths, so it makes it very hard to see who's talking at the moment. And um, that started a need to build our own puppets at first. Uh, the team did enlarged versions of that and eventually I got asked to make one puppet for a show. That turned out to be two puppets and the next year it was four puppets and so our puppet pool grew and grew and grew. What did I do? First I had to think about the design limitations. So it has to be visible, it has to fit the puppeteer's arm and hand. That is a very, very important restraint because a lot of these Folkmanus puppets are not meant to be used by adults. So some puppeteers could just not fit inside. They cannot be too heavy. For a two hour show, the puppeteer has to hold the arm like this and that gets heavier and heavier and heavier so I try to reduce the weight as much as I can. Unfortunately there are also some design limitations that are against that. It has to be sturdy. The puppets have to survive each year for rehearsals and the show and it gets really hectic backstage so the puppeteer has to uh, pull the puppet on and off a lot um, there are sometimes changes in a scene so the puppet has to switch the puppeteer and that does put a little bit of strain on all the material so what materials do I use? The body, the arms and the legs are mostly built with foam. 
I like to use closed cell foam like this yoga mat here just from a local supermarket about 1 to 1.2 centimeters thick and I need about yeah this much here to build the main part of a body for a puppet. There are of course thinner types of foam. If you ever want to use those, make sure that they are not easily damaged. So if you press it down and it does not come up again like this one, it's not that great to use for a puppet's main body, but it may have uses for padding outside because this foam here is super, super light. And it is also closed cell foam, so it will not hold moisture inside. It's easy to clean, just use an alcohol wipe and you will never have a mold or bad smells on them. I also use pipe insulation for the arms and the legs to connect this pipe insulation to the body. I use a strong type of webbing, this stuff here, that's uh, in Germany sold to be used for window blinds. So it's very, very tough and you can easily cut it and glue it to foam. I glue that stuff with hot glue. I only use a high temperature hot glue that creates a little problem with the pipe insulation because that stuff cannot really take a lot of heat but I found a way around that. Why do I not use a low temperature hot glue? It's not that durable. The type of hot glue that I use is normally used in the automotive industry. So it's a industrial hot glue that stays flexible for many, many years. So you do not have to be afraid that it will crumble after several years and it's still flexible. It does not stiffen the foam. There it's and of course, I also use as much as I need and make sure that uh, I don't create extra weight if it's not needed. For the outside of the puppet, I sometimes use upholstery foam, the normal foam that you get for a mattress. I don't use that inside because it can collect all the sweat and then get a bacterial problem. The next thing that I use are aluminium rods for the hands. These are just pieces of six millimeter diameter aluminium. I can buy those at a local hardware store um, one meter long and I bend those. The last thing that I need for the body are shoe lances because the legs are actually attached by those. I usually make the legs detachable. That makes it easier to store the puppet. It also makes it easier to ship. In the show we normally leave the legs on because it's just too much of a hassle to get them on and off again. For the hands I use um, a bendable wire inside so that the hands can be posed. I use black satin fabric for the lips, cable ties to attach parts together and if I use a 3D printed head base I need um, PLA or PETG filament. If you do not have a 3D printer don't worry, it is not necessary. I use 3D printing because I do not have enough spare time to make everything by hand. I used to do all the things that I do now with 3D printing before I got a 3D printer. And to glue stuff to my 3D printed parts, 
I use some polymorph pellets. That's just a plastic that gets soft, hand moldable at 62 degrees Celsius till it cools down again. And you can always reheat it. And of course, you need thread to soup all the fur together, and you may also need a zipper if you want to have a secondary entry to the back of the neck, which my puppets have, because sometimes we do have to use that for a scene where the puppeteer cannot be underneath the puppet. All the tools that I'm using are really simple. So a basic set of scissors, a hot glue gun, pliers, that's all stuff that most people have. If you do not have a hot glue gun, you can do it without. I've used several types of glue before that work as well, but I do not really like the smell and a lot of glues have the problem that they harden over time and I want it flexible. Bart cement, for example, is a good alternative, but I prefer hot glue. And if you want to use polymorph or friendly plastic or uh, pellets with similar properties, it is easiest to use a hot air gun. Make sure to get one that has a low temperature setting, because if you get the plastic too hot, you can burn yourself. And that really hurts. A sewing machine is also not necessary. You can sew everything by hand if you want to. I still do that most of the time. That here in the picture is all that I use to build the main part of the body. I've made some kind of a standard design for a body. It's an anthropomorphic figure that's about one meter tall. That so I should say figure, not body. I'm sorry, <laughs> mistype. So the whole puppet is one meter tall, uh, excluding ears because they can vary a lot. For the pattern, I have made this pattern here. That was several times changed in the past. If you want to use a pattern like this, it's easiest if you make that yourself about the same shape and uh, make it to fit you and not uh, use something that is meant to uh, fit most of the puppeteers of the Euroference Puppet Show. This is meant to go over my arm here. This part on the top, that's the neck of the puppet. And here at the bottom is the hole that the puppeteer grabs through. If you see a puppet from behind, do I have one without clothing on at the moment? Oh, yes, I do. <clears throat> I normally leave a little bit of fur here, and even in pictures, you barely see that there is an opening. The main part of the body is then glued together. I add more flexible foam for the parts that will have to move. Here you can see if the puppeteer moves his arm forward, the body moves with it. So I do not have a stiff body and it can also turn to some degree. How much is of course kind of uh, limited by how big the puppeteer's arm is. We can look down or look up and bend the body a bit. Here in front, you see the webbing that I use to reinforce the whole thing. It is not completely necessary, but I have to use it because of the show requirements. The puppeteers, when they 
uh, grab the body here and put it on, they will pull on it. And if they always just pull on a bit of foam here, the foam will eventually rip. But the webbing is super strong and it will hold the whole thing together. I also add that here at the bottom, so it's easier to do it like that. And I also have to reinforce the shoulders here because the arms are actually played by a second puppeteer and that one will pull on the puppet when he plays the arms. So it has to be sturdy enough to withstand that. Besides the webbing here, there is nothing inside. It's completely free to move. And I made sure that I have indentations here that stop at the maximum possible position. So you can bend a little bit in this way, but you can only bend it a lot this way. What I have here is one of my older puppet heads. This one was made with plastic mesh and a lot of cable ties. The eyelids were also hand molded. I bought a 4 cm metal ball on eBay that I used to sculpt the eyelids over it. They are also made with hand moldable plastic. For this hat, I connected both of the eyelids together so that they can be used just with one lever. This type of construction is not that complicated. It's easy to learn. It's the same kind of construction that I used for years for my first suit hat bases. And it's very durable you will not break that easily. It's even more durable than 3D printing, but of course it takes time. And if I do not have enough time, I have to find other alternatives. What I do today is 3D printing. Like I said, I'm using the same 3D models that I've already used for my fursuit head bases just scaled down. So if you watched the puppet show last year, the rabbit puppet Alice was actually based on one of my fursuit head designs. I've also now started to print the eyes and the teeth. The older puppets have all eyes that are made from ping pong balls. This one here on the screen does have those too, but those are a little bit limiting. Um, if you compare that to my new kind of eyes, those look a little bit different. They are 3D printed with a resin printer and I painted the eye inside and filled the indent that I made for the iris and pupil with transparent resin so it does reflect the light really good and I've also made them movable by adding a lever in the back and I made here an attachment point for a LED so the whole light can be easily used to light up. I also made a secondary version that does have a hole in here to insert a camera, but the super small, super cheap cameras that I bought had not really good resolution, so I haven't used that in a puppet. As for the teeth, I can hand mold them with polymorph without problems, but it takes time and these teeth, for example, were 3D printed and by now 
a normal hobby 3D printer can have a quality that's good enough so you do not have to send those anymore. You cannot really see any layer lines here. And I can just attach the teeth like they are. Like I did here. And they are stronger than we look. So if anybody wants to take a bite out of an apple, it is possible with those. Here is a close-up of the eyes that I just showed. I also made movable eyelids for those, and most of my puppets do have uh, movable eyelids. What I use to move those is just a bicycle brake cable. So that looks like this. This is the same model that I print for the puppets, just scaled up. And that's also a prototype where I tried to make the eye totally movable. We never used that because it takes up extra space and there is not that much space in the puppet head itself. So that's more of a proof of concept here and here you can see if I push on the end the eyelid closes if I pull the eyelid opens and that's it I could really build it like that I make it a little bit more complicated the puppeteer has to know where the eyelid is and so I needed to return to a default position and to do that I built a handle. That's the handle here, it's 3D printed with two rods that are used to hold this 3D printed slider here. I also added um, some uh, screw nipples here that are then used to hold the end of the cable in. And as you can see, if I let go, it returns to the default position and it can be used both ways. So for the eyelids, that means I can have a neutral position where they go, I can have surprise and I have close the eyelid completely. The hands and arm rods also had a little evolution. At first I did attach the arm rods in one position. That has a little problem because if you have an arm rod going down statically from the hand, it only moves in this plane and the only way to rotate the hand is then for the second puppeteer that holds the arm rod to get away from the puppeteer and that's not easy to do on stage so the arm rods that i build now they have a hinge here and that hinge makes it very easy for the for the second puppeteer to get the the hands in the direction he wants to so if he moves the hand up it will automatically rotate because the arm is pulling on it 
and if he moves down, the hand will rotate down. All the newer puppets have now this feature and it makes it easier to do some things that the old puppets were never able to do. The old puppets uh, could only do high fives like this. Mm, mm. The new puppets, we can really do that. Without the second puppet here having to switch positions or something, because with the old system, you would have to hold the hand rod like this, and that would be visible from the audience, so we could not do it. Here's how they are constructed. As usual, I always try to save time, and so I have made a cutting pattern that I can use with my laser cutter, so I do not even have to cut those out, but of course you can cut them out with normal scissors just as well. Here's another close-up of the arms, so that you can see the angles that I cut better. And here are the legs. Uh, the legs have several parts. The top part is made with more rigid foam, so they stay in shape. The legs do rotate in uh, the middle where the shoe lenses emerge. And I better show that on the main camera. They stay in place, but they're very easy to rotate. And from the front, it looks like the legs end here and not here on the sides, because I added extra padding here. And that's just cheap mattress foam on the sides. That's also important because these parts are kind of a safety hazard on stage, so people will run into them, so you want to have very soft foam here on the sides. Yeah, and the, the paws, they are just pieces of foam glued together. There is only the rotating hinge, the hinge at the knee, and that's limited to about 45 degrees of movement and just to the front, it does not move sideways. I did that with this extra piece of foam, very soft foam here on top. This limits how much it can rotate. On the bottom here, there's also a piece of pipe insulation underneath. I just changed the shape a little bit to make it more interesting to look at. And the arms for most puppets are just the pipe insulation. Only if I make a very muscular character, I add extra foam on top of it. With one exception, and that is the shoulder. The shoulder is also a more rigid foam, and it is just glued on here on the upper end of the arm. And it moves freely, it has no connection to the inside. That's all just here the webbing. Fur. If you want to get good fur, you have to pay the price. I did use some cheaper alternatives in the past, but I have to tell you, most of the furs from the really good looking puppets were really expensive. So if you, for example, look at the 
snow leopard here that type of fur uh, costs at the moment i think about 60 euros per meter and you need at least one meter i usually buy a little bit more sometimes enough to make a fursuit from it as well i recommend using fur that's about 0.5 to 3 centimeters long 3 centimeters is kind of the maximum i do not want to use longer fur because when you just have a big blob that's not really visible on stage anymore how do i make the pattern for the head i use painter's tape and I've got one here I cover half of the head in painter's tape and I paint on the painter's tape what patterns I want from different kinds of fur. And when I did that, I cut that in the middle and I make a pattern that's half of the head and I just flip it around for the other side. Well, all of my heads are symmetrical, so I can easily do that. If you have a not symmetric head, of course you have to do it for the other side as well. And I always add a little bit of seam allowance. For me, that's usually three to four millimeters. Here in the picture, you can see that I sew most of that by hand. By the way, the fur is always cut from the back side and I use a sharp blade, a scalpel normally for that. The reason why I do it is if you cut fur with scissors and you're not really, really careful it can happen that you cut the fur on the outside as well. And if you cut the fur, these kind of cuts are very visible. And I don't want that. Here you can see a head that is furred, but it's still the original length of the fur. And from the big eyes, you can barely see anything. So I have to shave that down a bit. For the body I make the same kind of pattern, I just pin pieces of paper on it and use the pieces of paper to cut the fur out. Trimming the fur is something that I make with these kind of scissors here. Those are hairdresser scissors that are meant to thinnen out, so they only cut each millimeter or yeah about each millimeter and leave one millimeter standing. That makes uh, the cut fur look a lot more natural. If you use uh, electric trimmer or uh, normal scissors, it is much harder to hide your cuts. Of course, that takes longer, but that's time that I'm willing to spend. So if everything is sewed together the puppet is finished that's it i'm sorry i did not have time to answer some of your questions thank you for watching hopefully see you next year friends